Romans chapter 3, verse 27 through 31. Uh, these, these lessons this morning that we're going to be dealing with, uh, we're going to be dealing with, the, with again, the issue, of the, the issue of being justified by faith alone and looking at it as far as what's being taught here in these verses. And I titled this, Is it a, a present time truth or an all time truth? And uh, there's some great uh, impact that's being made by uh, understanding justification in God's sight unto eternal life uh, being the thing that it is. And, and Paul's utilizing... Uh, to, to improving, I'm giving the answer away, uh, by proving that it's an all-time truth, being able to utilize the information to prove that we today, in this dispensation of God's grace, are justified by God's grace uh, through faith uh, in Christ alone. And so, um, again, we're going to uh, identify that the messages are different, but nevertheless, the response that God requires out of man has always been and is and always will be by faith and faith alone. And we're going to see that faith and works are actually, actually and we, we've already seen this, are, are opposed. And we're going to look, take a look at the, uh, a definition of faith and what faith is in and of itself. But let's read Romans 3, verse 27 through 31, have a word of prayer and get into our study this morning. Romans chapter 3 and verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to gather together to um, come to understand your word. And Father, I pray that as we do so, um, that we would redeem the time to your honor and glory. And that we would be attentive to what you, uh, what you have here on the pages of your word. And so that we might come to know them and understand them and therefore know you and understand more of you. And um, have the living, your living words live within us. Father, we, we count it a grand privilege to be able to do so. And may we never take it for granted. And so uh, as we come together this morning, may we not just fill a seat, but may we come to understand your word and incline our ear to understanding the matters set forth before us. And may we test them and prove them uh, to make sure they're not coming from myself uh, and, and, and just my own wisdom, but that they're your wisdom, that it's your words. And uh, if there is any error in them, may we not receive it. Uh, I pray that the, the saints would not receive it, but the, if it is truth, may they believe it as not the word of men, but as the word of God, which worketh effectually in them that believe it. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning. We thank you for your son. Without him and what he did there on the cross, uh, we wouldn't be here, uh, nor would we, uh, we even care about these matters. So we thank you for him and everything that he's provided for, for us in this dispensation of grace in which we live. Father, we thank you for this time again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're dealing with, uh, <clears throat> we're still here in Romans chapter 3, but as we've been dealing with the last few lessons, we're dealing with a kind of a, a different group, a grouping of information. Paul has set forth and in, 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 in a complete manner um, that as he described there in Romans 3 and verses 19 and 20, specifically verse 20, he says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And with that information and the, the information of us being worthy of God's wrath, and that there's no escape from that, and, and he's given his final summation in proving that very thing, as he, as he dealt with in verse 9 of Romans 3, uh, he's proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. With doing that, that implies to us, we, we understand, or at least we should understand, from Romans 1, uh, verse 17. Look there real quick with me, because we're going to be, this, we got to dock this in the back of our mind, especially as we're dealing with the information that we're dealing with in the rest of chapter 3 and in the whole of chapter 4. Look at Romans 1, verse 17. He says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that expression, the just shall live by faith, come along and provide us the understanding that God is justifying us. 
that he is, is justifying. He's in the business of justifying unjustifiable men. I shouldn't say unjustify, unjustifiable because they are justifiable, but he's in the business of justifying unrighteous men, unjustified men. And so uh, we should, and we should already know that from Israel scriptures and the Old Testament scriptures that God has been justifying. This isn't something new that God is justifying men. And so we should know that he is justifying men. And with all that information, we should come to understand that what he has to do now in verses 21 is to explain to us how he is justifying men. And that's what he does explain. And he explains that the righteousness of God, the very thing that we need, has been made available to us. And that righteousness of God is equal to the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It's equal to what Christ did on that cross. And therefore, he has done all the work, and we, there's no work on our part. And so God sets him forth to be the satisfactory thing that he is, the, the, the full and complete payment of sin. Uh, and that's what he did for on the cross, and he sets him forth. And it to be the satisfactory thing to his justice, if someone believes in it. If someone believes in his blood. And that's what he declared there in, uh, and, and set forth there in verse 25 of Romans 3. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a, a satisfaction to his justice through faith in his blood. And so when God sees man's faith resting, and not in their own work, but in the work and the faithfulness and fidelity of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for them, he will justify you. He will declare you righteous in his sight. And we looked at that ledger of what justification is. Justification deals with both the debt aspect of your ledger and the credit aspect of your ledger. The debt, all you had was sin. As far as your debt, he forgives all that. And then he, as far as the credit part, you had no credit on your ledger. He gives you and imputes unto you his righteousness. Which also means if he imputes unto you his righteousness, he has to take away and, and forgive all sin. Past, present, and the future sins that you're going to commit. That's the grace of God. That's what's wrapped up in the gospel of Christ. And so he'll justify you. And if you have all your sins forgiven and you're imputed his righteousness, that's the recipe for eternal life. And he's, you then become a possessor of eternal life by his grace through faith in the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul knows, and, and, and that's what we've been dealing with. Paul knows that there's going to become... Let me get through our, our outline slides here. Um, Paul knows regarding that redemption that is in Christ Jesus and that the way in which you receive the benefits of that redemption through faith and faith alone, uh, that issue of faith is going to be a, 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 a testing point to the unbeliever. It's going, to be, it's going to be something that tests the volition of the unjustified person because they've been... As they've been following the course of the world that's been established, that, 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 that goes along with their, and, 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 and works with their sinful nature, the flesh nature, they want to work for it. They want to work for their salvation in order to be justified. They, in some way, however grand it is, however big it is, or however small it is, man wants to have a say in their justification and therefore boast about it. Have some say in their justification. And when you are justified unto eternal life in God's sight by, the, the mechanical, uh, by, by your positive response of faith and faith alone, faith is not meritorious by nature. And therefore, there's no, you have no say in your salvation except just receiving something that Christ has done fully and completely for you. And so that is going to test the volition of someone. And, and I brought up the examples before is that you'll hear this when you share the gospel. So it can't be that easy. Now we understand and, 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 you, and you hear the terms out there in religion and Christianity, cheap grace, easy believism. And all those things are to slander the grace of God. Now we understand that God's grace, what went into it was the death of his son. And regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, it, took, it, it cost him his life. And not only that, but the the payment of eternal damnation and, and, and three, it took him three hours on the cross to do it, but he, he took it all. Now that's, I can't go into explaining that, 
Hebrews talks about he's able to do that through the eternal spirit. But he takes the eternal consequence for our sin. It took him three hours to do it on the cross. He did that on the cross. And so this is going, and, and, and so all these terms, cheap grace, easy believism, and it can't be that easy, all these things somehow slander the grace of God. And we understand regarding, from God's perspective, hey, it cost him a lot. But it cost him a lot, and it cost him everything, as it were, his son and his son's life, so that it wouldn't cost us anything. And so someone who comes along and says, oh, that's just cheap grace, and that's just easy, they don't understand what, what, what Paul's teaching. And so it is easy for us, and it needs to be easy for us. Otherwise, there's no way in which we would be justified in God's sight. And it's not cheap because all we have to do is believe. It costs God his son and his son his life. And his son to, to suffer the torments of death and hell there on that cross. And so it, it wasn't cheap in that sense just because we believe in it. And so those are all those expressions that... that and I'll, I used to believe, and I used to think, and I used to teach, and I used to say. But when you understand what's being taught, uh, it, it's not cheap. It was expensive. It taught, it, again, it, it cost God his son. And on, the, and on the other hand, it is easy. And we ought to be thankful that it's easy. And because of that, within that easiness and that simplicity that's in Christ, because it is that, out of that comes the motivation for us to serve God. Well, Paul knows that that's gonna, the issue of faith and faith alone is going to test the volition of an unjustified man. Before he, before he believes, he might come along and say, I don't know about that. You're saying I have no part, as far as my flesh, my works, I have nothing to do with my salvation. I don't know, that, that just seems too easy. That's too simple. And he's going to come along and try to and, and escape this issue that it really is by faith and faith alone. And so what Paul's going to do now is he's going to focus on and highlight that issue of it is by God's grace through faith. And he's going to prove. And he set forth that legal proof there in Romans 1 verse 17, the just shall live by faith. And as he quotes it from Habakkuk 2.4 in the Old Testament. And what Paul's going to do now is he's going to focus upon the issue of faith. In, in Romans 3, 27, all the way to chapter 4 and verse 25. And he's going to focus on the issue of faith and prove. He's going to prove without a shadow of a doubt that God does justify by his grace through faith without any works of any kind at any time. And therefore you have the Catholicism who says, hey, it's faith plus your works in order to, to receive eternal life. That is, that's out of the picture. And then you have someone who comes along and says, you have faith, you're, you're saved, but if you don't have works, then you can lose your salvation. Nope, they're out of the picture. And then you have those that come along and say, well, you're saved, but if you don't have works, that, uh, then it might, it might mean that you're never saved in the first place. Nope, they're out of the picture because it's not, works have no place. And I, and I get on that because that's God's grace. As soon as you add works of, I don't care how you dress it up, as soon as you add works, you take away from the grace of God. And it's pure grace, it's pure Him. And faith allows it to be by God's grace because faith is trusting in someone or something to do for you that which you cannot do for yourself. And so it's by God's grace through faith and ultimately in Christ and what He's done. And so you dress up any way you want, but you're teaching error or you're believing error if you think of that or you believe that. Works have their place. We're going to get to works. We're going to get to how we live pleasing in God's sight. But when it comes, and that's why you have to understand the, the different kinds of justification. And I do have a slide. Hold, uh, bear with me here as we, as we go through this. And we went through this before. There's eight different kinds of of justification and that's why it's so important to understand this issue of the kinds of justification in your Bible and before you get to Romans 3 you've dealt with you dealt with 
uh, justification of God himself and his word. He dealt with all of these. Actually, you deal with all of them. You've dealt with all eight before you get to Romans 3. And you have to understand that there's a, there's a, a specific kind of justification that Paul's now coming along and talking about. And he's talking about the most important, but not the only one. The most important being justification unto eternal life. And you can add in his sight in, in regarding that one. And that's the issue of his grace by faith and faith alone. And so it's important to understand and distinguish between these because there is a justification. A justification by works in the eyes of men as the friend of God regarding Israel's program. And there is a justification regarding our program, another one, justification at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be either seen as right or wrong at the judgment seat of Christ. Regarding what you believe, regarding your conduct and behavior, you're going to be justified in that sense, but it has no bearing upon your eternal life. And again, by definition of justification, there can be different kinds of justification. Justification is the action of justifying, which is the issue of showing or making in some manner or form something to be just, right, righteous, or proper. That's the, a good working definition. And we talk about justification in regards to our judicial system here in America, but that has nothing to do with eternal life. We talk about, I was justified in saying that, or I was justified in doing that regarding your spouse or your friend or your family, but that has nothing to do regarding justification unto eternal life. And so what we have here is we're dealing with justification, a specific kind, a specific type of justification, and it's the justification unto eternal life. That is all by God's grace. It's received by faith and faith alone. And so we're going to be dealing with these things more as we go on. And salvation, too. Salvation, you can't standardize these words. You have to have a good working definition, and then the context is going to add, add to uh, what type or kind of justification it's going to be, or salvation. Salvation is the act of being saved, delivered, and or rescued from some predicament, peril, destruction, loss, or calamity. Well, notice how it says some predicament. There's a lot of predicaments you can be in that you need to be saved from. Not just the salvation from the debt and penalty of your sins. There's a lot of perils that you could be in. A lot of destruction or loss or calamity that you can be in that you could be saved from. And when it comes to salvation, there's salvation from the debt and penalty of one's sins. There's salvation from some physical peril or death. There's salvation from the satanic policy of evil. Salvation for godly women, as Paul talks about in 1 Timothy there. Uh, the, the day of the Lord, salvations, what Israel can avail themselves out of, uh, out of there's going to be calamity and judgments coming upon them at that time, and they can be saved from those things uh, in the day, day of the Lord. There's salvation from adverse judgment by the perfect law of liberty. That's, that's regarding Israel's program and, and things that James talks about. Uh, we won't get into that, but I'm, again, I'm just listing them for you. There's a, just, uh, a justified Israelite salvation from the effects of national Israel's judicial blindness that Paul's going to talk about in Romans 9. We'll deal with that when we get there. There's uh, our, uh, our rapture salvation from the Lord's day of wrath. The rapture is... is is uh, talked about as far as salvation goes. We're going to be saved from the day, day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's wrath. Uh, salvation from functional death. Uh, Paul's going to deal with that in Romans 6, 7, and 8 of how to live pleasing unto God. Well, you cannot live pleasing unto God. You cannot function unto God's plan and purpose, and therefore uh, it be a, a death to you. Or you can function unto God and it be a life, but you can be saved from that. Our salvation from misery in connection with the sufferings of this present time. Paul will talk about that in Romans 8. Our salvation from grief in connection with the sufferings of Christ. Paul will talk about that in Romans 8. And we dealt with that regarding our suffering series on Thursdays in, in, in 2 Corinthians as well. And salvation of all Israel that eventually will take place, the true Israel that will take place out here. These are all different kinds of salvation. That if you're not a workman, the tendency is that it's all the same thing. And I've been there. I've done that. It's confusing. And it leads to doctrinal error. And so, again, I bring up all this to, to show you that you need to be able to distinguish between the different kinds of justification and different kinds of salvation. And when it comes to our text right now, we're dealing with justification unto eternal life in God's sight. 
that being by God's grace through faith in faith alone. And we'll deal with this more in detail as we go on. Um, what Paul does here in Romans chapter 3, I know I'm, I'm, I'm just talking to you right now, but this portion of Scripture is so important. And the more and more I've studied it, the more and more um, I, I, I realize that. And obviously you understand that all of God's Word is important, but um, I don't know about you, but this is a peculiar, it was a peculiar passage to me. He starts talking about how you can be justified, but then he starts talking about Jews only and Gentiles and circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Well, there's a difference there. Uh, and then the whole issue of do we then make void the law through faith? Well, he just said that the law has no part in justification. And now he says, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Well, wait, I don't, that didn't make sense to me either. So this is important to understand. And then Romans 4 has always been peculiar to me. Um, you would think that he would jump, just jump into Romans 5, give you the benefits of your justification. But then he goes in and starts talking about Abraham and David and, and then Abraham some more and all these things. And so as I've studied this, um, what Paul does is, and, and it doesn't need to be broken down this way. These are things I just try to help, uh, help to get in your minds and help for us to understand information. Is that there's a, a ring of evidence that Paul gives here. In Romans chapter 3, 27 to the end of chapter 4. And again, when we see, uh, look at verse 26 of Romans 3. He says, to declare, I say, at, his, uh, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. But then jump down, jump to chapter 20, or sorry, chapter 4, and verse 24. Look what he says. He says, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. It's almost like he comes full circle. He deals with a lot of information. He deals with the issue of faith. But then it's like he comes full circle. And then when you get to chapter 25, he says, therefore being justified by faith, we have. And he's going to start now explaining what you've received if you've had faith in, in, in what Christ has done for you, God has justified you, and therefore being justified by faith, we have something. And he's going to go on to explain what we have. And so there's like a ring of evidence. And the first part of the ring is in Romans 3, 27, verse 31, what we've been dealing with in the, in the last few lessons. Uh, the second aspect of the evidence is in, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. He's going to deal with Abraham and David. In that, in that passage. And then he's going to talk a little bit more about David and then go back to Abraham. And that serves as the third ring of, part of the ring of evidence, chapter 4, 9 through 12. And then there, the next one is in chapter 4, 13 through 16. And 16, I, I put the C on there because it's broken up in, in, in kind of three sections. And um, it goes until the third section, or, I'm sorry, four sections. Um, We'll, we'll deal with that once we get there. And then the final piece of evidence is in chapter 4, verse 16 to the end of the chapter. And so these, this ring of evidence and these five exhibits, uh, exhibits of evidence are going to, pro are going to provide for us to, to see that God really does justify by God's grace through faith and faith alone. Okay, so it's like Paul's the prosecuting attorney, and there's this issue now of, of he's, he's proven that, that ma the man, the defense is, is guilty before God, he's unrighteous and guilty before God, and that he, can, he, he cannot be justified on his own doing. And now he's provided the information that you can, but, but Christ has provided you to do. Uh, provided for you to be justified in God's sight, and you just need to believe in him. And now it's like the defense comes up and says, there's no way that's possible. There is no way I can be justified by faith alone in what Christ has done. And it's not the issue so much of what Christ has done, but the defense is coming along and saying, this issue of faith, no. That, that, that can't be. That can't be the way in which I respond and then I get justified. And Paul's going to come along and say, you want to bet? <laughs> I'll prove it to you. And he gives these five exhibits of evidence. The first one, boom. 
the second one, and each piece of evidence in and of itself proves that man really is justified by faith and faith alone. But then when you have them as a package, they, well, I'm supposed to be saying these things as I'm doing my slide, but I'm not that good yet. So it's going to prove it legally that God does justify by faith. And not only that, but by the time that we get through the end of chapter 4, and you just have to believe me at this part, we'll, we'll deal with it once we get there. But not only is it proven legally, it's proven morally and ethic, ethically. When God looks at the issue of faith, when he sees faith and faith in him and what saving faith is, we'll deal with that in chapter 4. It's not, only, it's not only legally right for, for him to justify men based upon their faith, but it's morally and ethically right to do so because of what faith is. And with that, it's an airtight case. It, uh, he's proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And the, sorry, the case is proven and the case is closed. And that's what this section of information is designed to do. Does that make sense? He's spotlighting, again, the issue of faith and faith alone. He presents these, this ring of evidence to, to prove that very thing. And by the time we get it, not only is he going to prove it legally, but he's going to prove it morally and ethically. It's the only way and it's the right thing to justify men based upon faith and faith alone in regards to what he's looking for in man's response. And that's what this information has done. Now, we've already dealt with verses 27 and 28, and we started to get there in verses 29 and 30, um, let, me, let me give you some more preliminary information too. All these things, again, uh, Paul says give, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Okay, Right now I'm just providing some exhortation. An exhortation has a lot of different functions, but one of them is to prime the heart, prime the mind for the information you're going to get and what it's designed to do. Now, as you go through the information in your studies, uh, you don't necessarily need to understand all that. You're just going to read it and understand it. But as far as the, my job, as Paul tells Timothy, that's what I'm supposed to do for you. I'm supposed to tell you what the information is designed to do. And then you get that and, and, and you take that home with you throughout the week, study it to see if it's true, see if it's working, see if it's, uh, it makes sense not only logically, but th and then see if it bears weight to uh, what's given in the scriptures that we looked at to see if it's true. And if it's true, if it's the word of God and that's what it's doing, then you believe it and it to work effectually in you. So I'm just giving you exhortation right now, telling you as I've studied this and as, as I've labored over it and giving it to you now as the, the preacher teacher, the, the bishop of the assembly, uh, what it's designed to do and what's designed to work effectually in you. Okay, so as we again dealt with this ring of evidence, the first ring of evidence is Romans chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. And that's exhibit A. So exhibit A of the evidence is in the rest of chapter 3. But this sec in, in Romans chapter 3, verses 27 through 31, it's broken up into three sections, okay? Section 1 is verse 27 through 28, and that's the information we dealt with. And what this declares is, is what I have written here. The court of justification unto eternal life will not allow for the admission of any works or deeds of the law, concluding, uh, concluding that the judge of this court can only justify man by faith alone. Look what he says there in verse 27 and 28. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Excluding, we, we dealt with last time, talking about that, uh, the example, uh, Cody brought it up, and then I use the example to, 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 to bring that to an image, is that you have this, uh, you buy an electronic and it says, battery is not included. Bat it's not like the batteries are in the, the electronic and then you take them out. That, that's not what excluded is. Excluded is they're not even in there in the first place. They're, they're, works are excluded in the court of justification unto eternal life. It's not that they were in there at one time and now they're out. And that's, what, that's what's going to lead to the next section. They weren't involved in justification unto eternal life and now they're taken out. Excluded means when God set up the rules and laws of this courtroom, they weren't allowed in the first place. Okay, that's important. So that's what that information deals with. He says, by what law are they excluded? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And notice how he says, a man. He doesn't say a Jew or a Gentile. He says a man. 
And I love how he's, he, he, he's consistent, because if you look at Romans 3, verse 20, he says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no what? No flesh. He doesn't say a Jew or a Gentile. He says, no flesh be justified in his sight. So that's the first section. The second section is verse 29 through 30. The legal operating force of the court, which is law of faith, is not something new, nor a late development in the court's legal operating force, but one that has always and consistently been in effect for all time, past, present, and future. The question would come up then, when you get to 27 and 28, is, well, is this the way that God has always been justifying? Paul's explaining this now. He says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of law. The question can come up, well, is this the way that God's always been doing it? And he comes up, and look what he says, and we're going to eventually get into this, but he says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. And now, now there is a difference in prepositions, which we left off dealing with last time. He says the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. But what's the common thing in both of those? Faith. And faith is the thing in which he's highlighted. He doesn't say by faith plus works. He just concluded that's not the way it is. He doesn't say through faith plus works. That's a different kind of justification, but not the justification he's talking about. Not when it comes to the court of justification unto eternal life. I keep saying it. Does, that, does everyone understand that there are different kinds of justification? If, if I... If Dean does something wrong to me, okay, if Dean comes up to me and he punches me, and I go back and I punch him, I could come along and say, well, I was justified. You punch me, I punch you. Does that have anything to do with eternal life? Is, is, first of all, is that a right way to use that term? Yes. I could be declared right in punching him. This is, a, I've told you, I'm notorious for my examples. But am I right in punching him because he punched me? Could I be declared right in doing that? Yes. It's not that he wouldn't be right necessarily. Well, he could be, I guess. He's not right necessarily to come up and just punch me, you know, for no reason. But if he had a reason, he could come along and say, well, I'm justified in punching you because you did this to me. But you can use that term. That would be a, a, a accurate, probably not the the best way to describe this word and, and the utilization of it, but that's a, you can utilize that, but that has nothing to do with eternal life. Okay? And so if you can see that, and you can see that example and the issue of justification to eternal life, there's at least two different kinds of justification. Well, now there's different scenarios in which that's utilized. For instance, you have judges back here, the book of Judges, who they, come, they came along and they established their, their system of declaring what was right and wrong within the nation, the nation of Israel, but that has nothing to do with justification unto eternal life. But nevertheless, within the nation, the judges would come along and say, you're right in doing that, you're wrong, here's, the, here's the, 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 the consequences of those things. But they would come along and justify the, the, the member of Israel. Well, you also have in our nation, a judicial system and whereby we declare someone to be right or wrong in their conduct and behavior and what they did. Um, you have the, the, the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer is going to be there. Every person who's justified unto eternal life is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. But that's a judgment. And a judgment comes along and says whether you're right and wrong. And therefore, we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ and, and that's what he says, what, whether what you've done in the body, whether it be good or bad. And you're going to be justified in what you've done and what you've believed or you're not. Doesn't mean that you don't have eternal life. It just means you weren't declared right. You're not holy, unblameable, and unreprovable regarding the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Those, so it's not wrong to utilize that term. You just want to clarify which justification you're talking about. Does that make sense? Does that help? Okay, so we're dealing with that one of eternal life. I know I kind of went off track there, but 
that justification to eternal life is the one we're dealing with. And this one operates upon the, the law of faith. How God set it up, it operates upon the law of faith. So that's the second section. The, the, the question would come up, would, is this how God has always justified men? Or has it changed? And that's where he's going to talk about verse 28, or sorry, 29 and 30. And then the last section is verse 31. The function of the court in the taking up of the legal matters before it in justified unto eternal life does not damage to any other law in any other court. In fact, just the opposite is true. All other law is established upon the law of this court, rendering the judge consistent in all things. And we'll deal with that more when we get to verse 31. But he says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish law. Did God... When, when God, I'll, I'll just I'll talk about it. When God justified Abraham, was the law in play? No. No, the law wasn't in play. In fact, Abraham, we're going to find out, Abraham is the example of how you get justified unto eternal life in God's sight. By faith and faith alone. Therefore, the law that comes after does... Does that take away what was already been established? No. Well, it shouldn't, right? If that one's established for the thing that it is, then this one shouldn't take away. Paul's looking at that as at reverse, okay? Paul's looking at it and saying, hey, you're not justified by the deeds of the law, uh, you know, you're by faith and faith of the Lord. Do we, does that make void the law? And he's saying, no, rather establish it. The, the law did something in connection with what was already established with Abraham. It didn't... It didn't add faith plus works, but as we understand the issue of what the law is, the knowledge of sin, it comes along and says, you can't be justified on your own. You can't measure up to my standard. And therefore, it establishes the fact that you have to be justified by faith alone. But we'll deal with that more as we get there. Look at, look at Romans chapter 3 now. And look at verse 29. He, he, again, he's just got done making the conclusion here. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And the question can be posed, was well, this how God's always been justifying mankind? He says, is he the God of the Jews only? What's the, what's the answer to that? No. Why? Gentiles also, and he's, he's God. I mean, yeah. How would you prove that? We talk about right division, right? When we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, we talk about God's program with Israel. And that's almost how we talk about it, that God, he was just dealing with Israel. In one sense, that's true. But hopefully now you can see the other sense that that's not true. In regard to his program... He had it with the nation of Israel. No other Gentile nation did he establish his program with. In fact, all the other nations had to come to them. That's what the kingdom is going to be about. Therefore, they had an honored status among the nations, and, and, and God made them that way, that it was going to be through their nation and their nation alone that he was going to establish his kingdom, and the Gentiles would have to come unto it. But that's an issue of their program. That's not an issue of justification unto eternal life. How would you prove that he's the, he's the God of the Gentiles also? Adam is created in the image and likeness of God. Okay, keep, keep going with that. Cody said Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. Was Adam a Jew? No. no. What else? Keep going. Progressive revelation. Yeah. Get, 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 get more into that. Pete said progressive revelation. What, is, what does that mean? Was Abraham always a, no, just say, Jew? He was an uncircumcised. Yeah. What about, what about other men before him? Noah. Yeah, Noah. 
Noah, what, was he a Jew or a Gentile? Is there any question that Noah was justified unto eternal life? Does anyone have a question that... No, when we think about, Noah, when we think about these, these guys up here, especially Abraham, Daniel, David, I mean, all the prophets, Noah. We, I don't know about you, but it's almost... Yeah, they're, they're God's, God's people. They're justified unto eternal... We don't question whether they're justified or not. And I don't think that's wrong. I think that's, that's right. God's, God's showing that. But by understanding that God didn't always have his program with Israel, he always had a plan and purpose for the earth, but it wasn't always through a nation. And, and as you look at both Abraham and you look at uh, Noah and, and Adam and, and these characters, they were justified, but they were justified before the law ever came into play. Now, you go back there, and it's kind of it's a little bit tougher to figure that they were justified unto eternal life. But God, Paul's going to teach us something regarding Abraham that, 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 that's true. Let's just briefly look at that. Look at chapter 4, and look at verse 1. He says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Notice those last two words, hath what? Found. When you find something, what does that imply? You didn't have it before? You were looking? What else? Lost. Found. Okay. Well, yeah. What, what else? It's lost, but what does that mean still? Yeah. What does it imply? Those are all synonymous words, but what does it imply? You got to know if you discover something. Right? And what does that mean? If you discover something, that's... If you discover or find something, what does that imply? I can't, I can't think of another way to put it, but... That it was always there. Yeah. Yeah. That it was always there. You go and find a treasure, right? You got a treasure map or whatever. And you go find or you discover something, but it's always been there, right? Uh, I saw a picture of, um, I forget where it was, but it was this mosaic uh, chapel or something they found on this hill somewhere. And it, I mean, they had trees all over. I mean, you look and it was just the part of the woods. But then someone goes and they find it or they discover it. And we'll look at the differences once we get there. And they, they're starting to uncover it, but it's always been there. As far as when it was built and, and things like that. But it, it's been there. And that's the, that's the aspect I want you to understand. When he talks about found, it's not that this wasn't existent before Abraham. But, it was, it, but Abraham found it, and, and God did something with Abraham that we need to look at. And so, and Abraham being in Gentile... He came out of the nations who God gave up. Being, Abraham being a Gent, was a, justified as a Gentile. And that's what I want you to see regarding verse 29. He says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And I'll be honest with you. I used to think that this was talking about Jews here and then Gentiles here. That's no longer my understanding. My understanding that God doesn't matter what program, what, whether it's past, present, or future, God would always justify Jews and Gentiles based upon their faith alone. Now, the Gentiles whom he gave up, he wasn't going to utilize them to uh, reconcile the earth. He took one man, Abram, and made a nation, and that's who he's going to utilize. And so these Gentiles went off in their idolatry, which... They wanted, so it, they would be less likely to trust that, hey, God, you need to save us. But nevertheless, God would. Rahab. Do you, know, you remember the story about Rahab? The, the, the two spies go, Joshua and Caleb go, and Rahab takes them in, a harlot, right? And what did, what did Rahab say? Let's go look at that one. Um, 
I forget exactly where it is right now. I looked it up this morning, but now I forgot. Is it, what, does anyone know where the story of Rahab is? I think it's in Joshua, isn't it? Or is it before that? Testing our Bible knowledge. Joshua 2. Yep, thank you. Look at Joshua 2. Yeah, Joshua sent out two people. Joshua and Caleb were the other ones that spy out the land before. Look at Joshua 2, only in verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of, of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went out and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to see thee, which are entered into thy house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she, she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they were... They which pursued after them were gone out. They shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said to the men, I, look what she says, okay? I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Notice this next part. And that, the, and that your what? Terror is fallen upon us. What's, what is terror in connection with? Especially in the context. What had just happened, well, years, years before now, but what had, where had Israel just came from? The yeah, the destruction of Egypt, right? And what is that a picture type of? And really is, in a, in a sense, but what is a picture of that of? The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day, which we also call what? The wrath, the wrath right? He said, and she recognizes, hey, that your terror is falling upon. She understands, although it's, it's nationally, but she, an individual Gentile in the land of Jericho, understands that God's wrath is upon them. I, I know there's a lot more being dealt with, but fundamentally, she understands that. The terror of the Lord has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up, and this is what she's going to talk about in connection with the terror, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, and Sion, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Their fame, if the fame went out, and, they, and she heard of this. And as soon as, ye, uh, as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither, there, uh, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God is God in where? Heaven above and in earth beneath. Remember when we dealt with that in Romans chapter 1? We dealt with that in connection with God consciousness, in connection with his creatorship and creating the heaven and the earth. She recognized that fundamental thing and that she, as well as her name, was deserving of what just happened to the Egyptians and the Amorites and, and all these people, that she was deserving. And look what she says. And as soon as we had heard these things, um, sorry, verse 12, now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utterly not, uh, utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by the cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt with upon the wall. Was, Abraham, was Rahab justified unto eternal life? It would seem that way. Just by the fundamental information that we have, she recognized that she was deserving of the terror of the Lord. Now, it was a physical thing right there, but she understood she deserved the terror, and she believed she knew and she believed in the God of heaven 
and earth. And she did not want to fall with the rest of her nation. Rahab was justified unto eternal life. Now, it doesn't say, but my bet, this is my assumption, so don't quote me on it or anything. My bet is she was justified before they came. And when she did come, because Hebrews ends up talking about Rahab. Let's go there. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, oftentimes people think that it's talking about justification unto eternal life when it's not talking about justification unto eternal life. It's talking about, if anything, it's talking about the justification by faith plus works in the sight of men. And when you talk about that justification, you're talking about a justification that it's rewardable. Look what he says here. Um... Look at verse 6 of Hebrews 11. But without faith is impossible to what? Please. We won't deal with that so much. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a what? Rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then he goes into Noah. And he doesn't deal with Noah just so much that he was justified. He was justified. But not only that, but God utilized him to build an ark and he saved his life and the life of his family. And he covenanted with him and, and, and those things. Look at, jump down. Um, jump down to verse 31. Hebrews 11 is dealing with the issue of faith, but in connection with someone being justified and they don't just stop, but they continue on to have faith, and they do the things that God explains to them to do as they diligently seek him, and he rewards them for it. And Rahab is in this list. In verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. One of the rewards that Rahab got, instead of her physically dying, she was able to live. You know the story. When they go into Jericho, the whole thing destroys besides Rahab's house. Where Rahab was and her family was. And God rewarded her for her faith. Not only was she justified unto eternal life. Again, Rahab's one of those characters that there's no question she was justified unto eternal life. And there ought not be any question regarding it. The question then is, is her faith rewardable or not? And in Hebrews 11 it is. I bring up Rahab because Rahab's a Gentile. Rahab's a Gentile when God started to do things with Israel in their program. And, and she doesn't necessarily come along and... I don't know the whole story about Rahab, so I would have to check myself on this. But she doesn't necessarily come along and follow them. She might have. As far as follow, But she does some things regarding Israel... And, and she's justified, and then she does some things to help out Israel, and, and it's rewarded. But she's justified by faith that she's deserving of the wrath of God. And she ex witnessed and heard about that wrath that, was, that spread under her. And she knew then that, that Israel's God was the God of heaven and earth, and that if she wanted any hope of, of, of having eternal life, of anything, that she would have to believe in him. To save her. Not just from the physical terror and wrath, but to save her from e e eternally. Come back to Romans chapter 3 as we want. We're going to have to again continue into the next session, but when he says here in Romans 3 verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? The answer is no. He's the God of man. Don't, we need to rightly divide. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely. But don't rightly divide to the point where you have to rest that verse. God created man. That's why Paul's making the conclusion, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And he says, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no... God created man. And he's going to justify man 
whether it's Jew or Gentile, when he makes that distinction, the same way, and it's by faith or through faith. He says, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And that's a prime example with Rahab, that he's the God of the Jews and the Gentiles. If you get anything from this first lesson, we're going to deal with more next lesson. But I want you to understand, justification by God's grace through faith alone unto eternal life in his sight is not a program issue. It's not an issue that you need to rightly divide. Because again, it comes to the, the, the aspect of God's character in essence, not the aspect of how God wants to reconcile the earth or reconcile the heavenly places. It's an aspect of his character in essence, his justice. And when it comes to his justice, that doesn't change. That can never change. And therefore, in order for him to justify men, he is going to justify them by his grace without any of their own merit. And therefore, uh, on their end, he, he requires a response of faith and faith alone. And the reason, especially in the Old Testament, that he would require faith and faith alone is because once the full payment of their sins is paid for, at the cross, when he puts that back on people, there can't be any works because there's no works allowed. If there's works on their account regarding justification to eternal life, then he can't take the full payment of sins and apply it to them. It is true in one sense, and hopefully you're getting this, you have to be... I know I've been saying in one sense this one. It is true that God is justifying men by his grace through faith in Christ. In all time. That is true. But you need to further define that in, in time. How that takes place. But it is true because ultimately God's going to take the payment of sin that took place on the cross. And he's going to apply it to those wherever they are on the timeline. If they had faith and faith alone in, 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 in God's message at that time. Now again, I'll put this caveat in there. Hopefully this isn't confusing because really, it, it, hopefully by now as we've been exercised in this, it's becoming less and less confusing. And if it is, I apologize, but we can, we'll, I can talk to you more uh, after the lessons and things like that or throughout the week. Although that's true in one sense, that's from God's perspective. But when you have an Israelite down here underneath that law, they're not believing in the faith of Jesus Christ, that cross work. But they're believing the fundamental reality that I can't do it. I'm a sinner. God, you need to do it for me. And we're going to take a look at another, a, next, uh, a passage next lesson that we've already looked at, but I want to look at it again. When they believed that, that was as if when God looked at that, they were believing Christ. Because who's going to do it for them? God is. But how is God going to do it? Through Christ. And so when they said, when they realized, when they were schooled by that law, I can't do this. I can't keep the law. I can't, these sacrifices, I, I just have to keep doing them. All, everything in that law taught them I'm a sinner. I'm deserving of, of God's wrath. I can't, God, you need to do it for me. God saw that and says, yeah, I will do it for you. And my son, that's what you're believing. You don't know it, but that's what you're believing. And therefore, he is just and the justifier of not only justifying us today who believe in his son, but those that believed in the past. Now, I know that raises a lot of questions regarding, well, what's the law for? And we'll deal with that throughout time. But Paul's not dealing with that yet. Paul's dealt with the issue that you're just, the law is the knowledge of sin. That's one of the main functions you need to understand right now in our edification the law is the knowledge of sin. And it doesn't justify men. Faith plus works, faith plus the deeds of the law doesn't justify men, nor just the deeds of the law justify. Don't, nope, it does not work. We'll deal with this more next lesson. We've got we to wrap up here. Again, if you have any questions, please come talk to me. But we have a long way to go through the chapter, go get through chapter 4. So 
a lot of this stuff is going to become repetitive, and that's what Paul's doing. He's taking these evidences to prove the same point, that man is justified by faith and faith alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look into this issue and um, glory in your grace. And if we're going to glory in your grace, then we need to understand that we are justified by faith and faith alone. And that's the only way in which man can be justified in your sight unto eternal life. Father, I thank you so much for this. Because without this, there's no way I would be saved from the debt penalty of my sins today. And I realize if it wasn't this way, there would be no Israelite under that law that could be saved either. Because they couldn't keep that law. Not one of them. And they could do the sacrifices, but that only proved to them that they weren't keeping that law. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you now that we believe in the full, manifest, revealed right, your righteousness, which is the faith of Jesus Christ, that we can believe in that. We don't believe your righteousness in its witness form. We believe in its full manifestation in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but what he did there on that cross as he performed redemption on our behalf. So, Father, I do pray if anyone's listening and they have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he died for their sins, was buried and rose again, they would do so right now. Have all their sins forgiven, past, present, future. Have your righteousness imputed unto them. And therefore, be justified in your sight, meaning they possess the gift of eternal life. We thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but as every man purpose in his heart, and, and, and as your word has worked effectually in us. You don't desire, you don't, uh, desire for us to give out necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, because you love a cheerful giver. So Father, we thank you for these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.